In the first lecture, I gave a very broad introduction to black holes. They represent extreme conditions in the universe, regions where, of space where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. Now, don't worry too much about the math. Just get the general idea that escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. The curvature of space is so great that light can't get out. What a wonderful concept. But how do black holes form in nature? Can it happen, in principle, almost anywhere? Here's a greeting card that suggests that this is the case. Another black hole starts to form, and wouldn't you know it, right in Sid's room. Well, in fact, this is not the case. One needs to cram a lot of matter into a very small radius, and this generally implies a very high density. Even if your cake came out too dense, it probably wouldn't be a black hole. Look at this. Gah! Well, I thought the cake came out awfully dense. This guy's being sucked into this black hole of a cake. <laughs> Sorry, it just doesn't work that way, folks. Well, some stars, on the other hand, should become black holes at the end of their lives. And to understand how this can be the case, in this lecture, I'll explore stars and their lives. Now, normal stars are simply very distant, faint versions of our sun. That's what the stars are. They're just distant suns. They produce energy at a relatively steady pace, converting hydrogen to helium in their very hot core through a process called nuclear fusion. Now, our sun is about four and a half billion years old, about halfway through its normal core hydrogen fusing stage. Let's consider the fusion in more detail. Specifically, here's how the energy is produced. You have protons, or hydrogen nuclei, and they come so close together that a force called the strong nuclear force grabs them and binds them together. And this can occur in a sequence of stages where ultimately a helium nucleus is built up, a nucleus consisting of two protons and two neutrons. So you went from four protons to two protons and two neutrons bound together. Now, along the way, two of the protons took in some energy and were converted into neutrons. And in so doing, they released ghostly little particles called neutrinos and also positrons, anti-electrons, if you will. So that's what happened to two of the protons. Now, it turns out that the helium nucleus is more tightly bound and thus less massive than the four protons of which it consisted, of which it was built. Binding energy is released. The actual energy that goes into binding those subatomic particles gets released. The total mass of the final product is less than the mass of the initial things that went into making it. And that mass difference through Einstein's E equals mc squared is the energy that we see. That's the energy that, that's emitted by, by the sun and other stars. Well, with this continuous source of energy, of new energy, the sun can remain hot inside for billions of years. And gas pressure is very high. So even though energy is leaking out, new energy is coming in from all these nuclear reactions. So the gas is hot inside it. It exerts an outward pressure, battling the inexorable pull of gravity, trying to pull it in, trying to squish it down. And for a while, in fact, that, that pull is not inexorable. The pressure can, in fact, balance it. And you have what's called hydrostatic equilibrium, mechanical balance. Let me give you an analogy. If I blow up this balloon, the pressure of the air inside is trying to push out, and that's balancing the tension of the rubber that's trying to pull it in. Neither one is winning. They remain stable in hydrostatic, that is, mechanical balance. That's what the sun and other stars are doing. All right. Well, what will happen to the sun in the future as it ages? We'll examine, or we have examined, many stars having different ages in order to get the life history of a typical star. That's how we do it. It's kind of like looking at human development. You look at lots of babies and adolescents and adults and older people to figure out how a typical person evolves through life. We also understand the physics of gases held together by gravity really well. So astronomers and physicists have come to a pretty darn good understanding of stellar evolution. Now, as our sun evolves, it will gradually use up the hydrogen in its core. 
In so doing, it's going to gradually brighten. In fact, global warming someday will be due entirely to the sun. You know, it'll get brighter, but very, very slowly. We have other issues to worry about first. Eventually, the star, the sun, will get brighter much more quickly, and it'll expand to form what's called a red giant. That'll happen because the central 10 or 15 percent of the sun's core will have already been turned into helium, and there will be no new nuclear reactions. But that core will contract. The contraction lets out energy. Any falling object lets out energy. That additional energy will heat the surrounding hydrogen-burning shell around the helium core. And in fact, that then will put additional energy into the outer atmosphere of the sun, causing it to bloat to form a red giant. So the sun will become this really big thing, getting as big as perhaps the, the current orbit, orbit of Mercury. That's really big. So a cross-section of the sun at this stage, in about five or six billion years, will show an inert helium core, a hydrogen-burning shell around that core, and an expanding hydrogen envelope around that, a vast envelope. Now, that helium core will gradually contract, and in so doing, it'll release energy, like the falling apple. That'll heat the gases in the core. Eventually, the core will become so hot, then helium can fuse into carbon, releasing more energy, and the carbon can grab onto another helium nucleus and form oxygen, releasing yet more energy. And this stage of the sun's life will last only about a million years, as opposed to the 10 billion years of normal core hydrogen burning. At this point, then, the carbon-oxygen core becomes inert. It can't fuse to form still heavier elements, it contracts, releasing energy, causing the helium-fusing shell around it to fuse faster. That then causes the hydrogen-burning shell around it to fuse even faster. That makes the star even more luminous, and it pushes the star out to form an even bigger red giant. Now, at this point, such stars, and including the sun in, in six or so billion years, become unstable. They go through what I call a series of cosmic burps, relatively nonviolent ejections, where the outer atmosphere of the star or the sun gets ejected. And you get an expanding shell of glowing ionized gas, gas whose electrons have been pushed away. So here's a cross-section of one of these dying stars where the outer atmosphere is being ejected away in a series of gentle eruptions, revealing a hot central core. Light from that hot central star ionizes the expanding shells of gas, which then glow. And you can see some of the beautiful disks of glowing gas surrounding the dying stars. Here's a very famous ring nebula in the constellation Lyra. There's the dying star right in the middle. Now, these objects are called planetary nebulae. This is the case because 19th century astronomers used pretty small telescopes that showed only a disk and didn't really show the central star very well, or it wasn't really clear that the central star has anything to do with the phenomenon. So they kind of looked like planets, and so they called them planetary nebulae. But really, these things have nothing to do with planets. But they're just gorgeous. Look at these examples of planetary nebulae, where the structure of the glowing gas differs from one object to another, depending on the details by which the star ejected its outer envelope of gases. Here's one called the Eskimo Nebula. Looks like a little bit like an Eskimo face. Oh, there's a beautiful one, too, the Cat's Eye Nebula. I love these things. They're so beautiful. Now, the central star of a planetary nebula is the denuded core of a once vibrant star. You know, the star is getting rid of its outer envelope, exposing inner hot layers, denuded of the hydrogen and, in some cases, even the helium, which used to surround it. So really what's left over is the inert carbon-oxygen core of the star, perhaps surrounded by some helium, in some cases a little bit of hydrogen. But the star has lost most of its gas. It ends up having a mass less than about one solar mass, one mass of the sun, even it start, if it started out having something like eight times the mass of the sun. So you get a lot of ejection of this sort. Here's another beautiful one. And this gets rid of, you know, 80 or in some cases 70, 90 percent of the star's mass. Now, the leftover star is a white dwarf. 
it's held up by what's called degeneracy pressure. Now, that's not because it's morally reprehensible or anything like that. Degeneracy pressure is simply the term that quantum physicists give to this weird quantum mechanical pressure, where basically electrons are squeezed into such a small volume that they have to move really fast in order to avoid each other. They don't like each other. They're particles called fermions, and in quantum mechanics, fermion particles don't like each other, don't like to be in the same place. So if you squeeze them to be in the same place, at the very least, some of them have to have really high speeds, and this is what keeps the star from collapsing. Now, a white dwarf has roughly the mass of the sun, or less, but only about the size of the Earth. So in fact, you can have all this stuff, hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the Earth, squeezed into a volume only the size of the Earth. That's an amazingly dense object. Well, that was the story for low-mass stars. Massive stars have much more violent deaths, and those are the ones that are potentially more closely related to black holes. Let's take a massive star like Betelgeuse, the left shoulder of the constellation Orion, the great hunter. It's a huge star. It's called a red supergiant. Look at that. It's about as big as Jupiter's orbit is around our sun. That's one heck of a star. Now, if you look at a cross-section of a red supergiant, I'm not saying Betelgeuse looks this way yet, but eventually it'll look this way, where you have an iron core surrounded by shells of progressively lighter elements, all the way out to hydrogen in the outermost envelope. It looks like an onion. Basically, what has happened is the ashes of one set of nuclear reactions became the fuel for the next set. So hydrogen became helium, helium became carbon and oxygen, then neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, all the way up to iron. Betelgeuse hasn't quite done this yet, but it will at some point during its supergiant stage. Now, when the mass of the iron core becomes about 1.4 times the mass of our sun, the core can no longer hold itself up. It collapses. Gravity is victorious. Nothing can prevent the star from collapsing at this point because the core simply became too massive and the pressure isn't great enough to balance it out. Protons and electrons combine to form neutrons and these ghostly little particles, neutrinos. And the whole thing collapses to form a neutron star, letting out all this energy, all these neutrinos. Now, a neutron star has a diameter of only about 20 kilometers, 12 miles, and is about one and a half times the mass of our sun. Imagine one and a half suns crammed into a volume the size of a city, folks. That is really dense stuff. That is nuclear density. A neutron star is, in fact, almost a black hole. Well, after this collapse, the outer layers actually bounce off. In fact, the neutron star sort of rebounds off of itself for a moment. Like if I jump on a trampoline, I rebound off of the trampoline. Well, the rebounding neutron star can actually eject the outer layers of the star. Suppose this basketball bouncing off of the floor is like the collapsing neutron star rebounding off of itself. And suppose this ball here is just the gas surrounding the neutron star that also collapses once the iron core collapses. Neither of these balls rises to a very great height if I just drop them alone because energy is dissipated. It's released during the bounce. But if I put the small ball on top of the large one, look what happens. Bang! Look at that! Oh, I love that doing that. In fact, I like to keep students awake in class by gently aiming it toward them. Look at that! Ha ha ha! So, anyway, this is a good way to keep students awake in class. How could they fall asleep when such exciting topics are being discussed? I mean, it's inconceivable. Well, when this happens, you get a supernova explosion like this one here. A colossal outburst, not a gentle eruption like what forms a planetary nebula, but a colossal titanic explosion. In fact, the neutrinos that are released help explode the star because this mechanical bounce isn't quite enough. But the neutrinos help 
the thing really explode and form a truly colossal, colossal explosion. In fact, 99% of the energy released by this collapsing core is in the form of neutrinos, but if just 1% gets channeled into the mechanical energy of the rebounding surrounding you know, layers of gas, then you can get a successful explosion. And during a few seconds, the supernova actually emits as much energy, mostly in neutrinos, as all of the optical light from normal stars in the entire visible universe. That's how powerful this explosion is, driven by the mechanical bounce and mostly driven by the neutrinos. These things can be millions or even billions of times brighter than the sun. So these are no ordinary fireworks. Now, I like a good 4th of July fireworks show, but boy, these things outshine any fireworks show you're ever going to see. You know, if you were trying to use sunblock when a supernova went off next to you, you, you wouldn't do very well with the kind of sunblock that's uh, sold in stores these days. Now, so much energy is released in this process that, in fact, heavy nuclei are built up through successive capture of neutrons. So you take some light nuclei and you capture a bunch of neutrons, and that forms heavy nuclei, even heavier than iron. So, in fact, a lot of the iron and all of the heavier elements come one way or another through supernovae. So we watch the star explode. Huge amount of energy. The ejecta start expanding, and they are chemically enriched in heavy elements, which weren't there before the star exploded, because the star's explosion itself produces a lot of these elements and ejects those that were produced beforehand into the cosmos. We see, in fact, examples of supernova remnants like the Crab Nebula, the remnant of the Great Explosion of 1054, and it's enriched in heavy elements. Even older supernova remnants like this one are seen to be enriched in heavy elements. And we see these clouds of gas gradually merge with other pre-existing clouds of gas, forming gigantic nebulae like this one. And eventually, the nebulae become gravitationally unstable, start to collapse, and form new stars. And here, in fact, you can see stars being formed, or newly formed stars, surrounded by disks of remaining gas and dust. And it is from these remaining elements that rocky, Earth-like planets can form. So our Earth was made out of the remains of, of many generations of previously exploding stars. Now on Earth, and perhaps on some other planets, at some point, microorganisms form, like nanobacteria, that are able to replicate and evolve. And eventually, over the eons and millennia, and millions and even billions of years, human life developed. DNA, and in fact, here's, here's my DNA. DNA is just such amazing stuff, a very complex molecule, a nucleic acid that holds the genetic code of life. All of the instructions needed to make proteins, which are long chains of amino acids, are stored within the DNA. You can't do it with just hydrogen and helium. You need the heavy elements. We are made of star stuff. This is what Carl Sagan meant when he so eloquently said this. We are made of star stuff or star dust. We are made of the remains of long exploded stars. What a fantastic concept. It's just mind-blowing. Now, Carl Sagan didn't discover it, but he very eloquently popularized this idea that we are made of star dust. Very important concept. Well, supernovae are rare. There's only about one per century per galaxy of stars, and galaxies consist of 10 or 100 billion stars. So they're like two-headed snakes. You know, you're unlikely to find one in your own backyard. You have to look at a lot of galaxies to improve your odds. So you look at galaxies and you see a star brighten over the course of a week or a few weeks, and then it fades slowly. I could occasionally look through a telescope and search for supernovae, preferably at night. You see more galaxies and stars at night than during the day. But, you know, I like to sleep, and so perhaps I could just have each of my students looking at lots and lots of galaxies all night, monitoring thousands of them until they find a bunch of supernovae, and then we let them graduate and move on to greener pastures. Well, this would probably be considered slave at labor, and I'd get fired. But fortunately now, with modern technology, there's an easier method. You can attach a camera to a telescope and take photographs almost automatically for lots of galaxies and then simply look for arrows. And in fact, it, you can see it works every time, once, twice, three times, four times, five times. I conclude by rigorous mathematical induction that looking for arrows will yield a supernova every time. Well, obviously, it's not quite that simple. 
Uh, we have a robotic telescope at Lick Observatory, about a two-hour drive from the Berkeley campus, where my associate, Wei Dong Li, has programmed it to look at thousands of galaxies each week, take new pictures, compare the new pictures with the old ones. Usually there's nothing new, but here you can see a new object marked with an arrow in the picture at the right. That's a supernova candidate. We get many candidates per night. They could be asteroids flying through the field of view or cosmic rays, charged particles that hit the detector. So I actually need undergraduates who use their superb eye-brain combination to look at these candidates and determine which ones are likely to be genuine supernovae. And we've done, in fact, the world's leading search for relatively nearby exploding stars in the past decade. By relatively nearby, I mean within a few hundred million light years from us. And, you know, a light year is the distance light travels in one year, 10 trillion kilometers, 6 trillion miles. So these are pretty far galaxies by human standards, but they're nearby for astronomers. You can see we discover nearly 100 each year, and we study them in, in great detail as well. So I'm very pleased with, with my group. Notice that we discovered the first supernova of the new millennium, regardless of your definition of the new millennium, 2000A or 2001A. That's not astrophysically important, but it's kind of cute anyway. All right, so we find these supernovae and we study them. We study them in detail. Now let's go back to the explosion mechanism for massive stars and see how it possibly relates to black holes. We had the core of a massive star that looked like an onion, and the iron was supposedly in a state where it underwent gravitational collapse to a neutron star. This was predicted by Fritz Zwicky of Caltech, who, working with his colleague Walter Bada, was the first to propose this mechanism. Now, Zwicky was a truly brilliant astrophysicist, but he was arrogant and abrasive. He didn't think much of his colleagues. Here, perhaps, he's showing you what he thinks of the typical brain size of his Caltech colleagues. Now, I don't know that that's what he's actually thinking, but wouldn't surprise me. Fritz was kind of that way, brilliant but arrogant. In fact, you know, he referred to his colleagues at Caltech as spherical bastards because, you know, they're bastards any way you look at them. This is not a good way to make or retain friends. But anyway, that's the way Zwicky was. Well, David Arnett, formerly of the University of Chicago, here is showing what the Sears Tower would look like if compressed to the density of a neutron star. Imagine, first of all, the Sears Tower filled solid with material, not largely empty, and then compress it to the density, the mass per unit volume of a neutron star, you'd get a little gumball like this. They are very dense objects held by neutron degeneracy pressure. The neutrons are squeezed so close together that they have to move really fast and exert incredible pressure. And this is what holds the neutron star up. Like I said, it has a diameter of about 12 miles or so, and uh, it's made of essentially nuclear material, mostly neutrons with a few other particles mixed in. We see some neutron stars in the middle of supernova remnants like this one, Cassiopeia A, or this one, the Crab Nebula, has a visible neutron star. Sometimes these things are visible as pulsars. They pulse on and off once per second or many times per second, and it's because energetic beams of particles move along a magnetic axis, and that axis rotates around an axis of rotation, and every time that lighthouse beam or laser-like beam intersects our eyes, we see a flash of light. Now, in 1939, J. Robert Oppenheimer and others showed that, in fact, if the mass of a neutron star exceeds a certain limiting value of around three solar masses, though we don't know exactly what that number is, then, in fact, nothing can resist the pull of gravity, not even this amazing degeneracy pressure and the neutron star collapses to a black hole. It's an amazing process. Now, it is conceivable that the cores of some massive stars, in fact, exceed three solar masses or two solar masses or whatever the limit is. In that case, they may well collapse to form black holes instead of neutron stars. And in fact, we will see in the next lecture that the so-called gamma-ray bursts are indeed objects in which this may be the case. They collapse to form black holes, not neutron stars. And in fact, there's some evidence that some supernovae produced black holes in binary systems bound with another star. And you can see from studies 
of the atmosphere of the remaining star that it has been polluted by material ejected by a supernova. Here's an example, an artist's conception of a black hole surrounded by what's called an accretion disk, and then there's a normal star next to it, and they're both going around their common center of mass. And if you analyze the atmosphere of the normal star through a process called spectroscopy, that is, you pass the light through a prism, spread it out into a rainbow or a spectrum, and measure all these dark lines, absorption lines, you can determine the chemical composition of the star. I don't have time to go into the details, but I cover this in, in a, lot, a lot more extensively in my large Introduction to General Astronomy class for the teaching company, and you can learn all the details there. But basically, when we look at the atmosphere of this one star known as V1033 Scorpii, we can tell that it's been polluted by ejecta from a supernova. Yet we can also tell that the compact object is a black hole, not a neutron star. So in some cases, it appears as though successful supernova explosions leave behind a black hole, not a neutron star. Now, another recent example of this kind of phenomenon is supernova 1987A, the first supernova discovered in the year 1987. It may have left a black hole rather than a neutron star. Supernova 1987A occurred in what's called the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of two main dwarf galaxies that orbit our big Milky Way galaxy. And if you look at the Large Magellanic Cloud, off to the left there you see a giant nebula, a giant region where massive stars are being formed and have been formed in the past many millions of years. And near that nebula, the Tarantula Nebula, in 1987 astronomers saw a bright new flash, an exploding star, the most easily visible exploding star in nearly 400 years. Well, this was a huge story. It made the cover of Time magazine. It said, bang, a star explodes, providing new clues to the nature of the universe. You know, you don't get stories like this on Newsweek or Time magazine covers every day. But hey, astronomy sells. People are interested. And when a star explodes almost in our backyard, that's a story to write about. Well, this star actually ejected, kind of gently, several shells of gas about 20,000 years before it exploded in its titanic explosion. These shells of gas are shown here. They look kind of like the shells ejected by regular stars that produce planetary nebulae. But if you look inside supernova 1987a, you know that there had to have been a neutron star there, at least initially, because a bunch of neutrinos were detected. Neutrino telescopes actually saw neutrinos from supernova 1987a. So a neutron star was formed temporarily. But look at it now. Look inside now. There's this glowing shell of gas ejected 20,000 years before the explosion. But in the middle, there's expanding ejecta, but no point-like neutron star. Right now, we have not yet directly detected a neutron star remaining at the position of the supernova 1987A explosion. So it's possible that some matter wasn't completely ejected and fell back onto the neutron star, making it subsequently collapse to a black hole. After all, the maximum mass of a neutron star is, you know, two or three solar masses, something like that. Even if the core was initially one and a half solar masses, it could have gained additional material and subsequently formed a black hole. Now, did this really happen? We're not sure. The jury is still out. The neutron star might be there and simply hidden from our view by a bunch of dust and other stuff that blocks the view. But there might be a black hole, and schematically this is illustrated here with the curvature of space being superposed on the Large Magellanic Cloud, a newly formed black hole. Well, that would be really cool. Are there any alternatives that exist to black holes? Well, it's conceivable that there exists a weird state of matter that allows a collapsed star to have a mass larger than that of the most massive normal neutron stars, yet not technically be a black hole. It would have a smaller radius than that of a neutron star, but a bigger radius than the Schwarzschild radius. So, for example, for a 1.4 solar mass object, it would have a radius bigger than 4.2 kilometers. Now, there are some X-ray observations of a supernova remnant known as 3C58, 
These observations reveal that the neutron star in the core of this supernova remnant has a temperature much lower than expected. And this suggests that a new state of weird nuclear matter might exist inside the star in order to cool it to a lower temperature than what we would have expected for a normal neutron star. But, you know, this is still controversial. There are more mundane explanations that exist. We're not really sure that there's anything intermediate between a black hole and a regular neutron star. Okay, well, even if there is a form of matter denser than a normal neutron star, quite general arguments suggest that at sufficiently high masses, collapse to a black hole is inevitable. So we see that black holes can, in principle, be created from massive stars that are simply unable to resist the relentless pull of gravity near the end of their lives. Besides 87A, though, where we're not sure, have we ever seen stars that almost certainly ended their lives as black holes? Well, stay tuned for the next lecture to find out.